Okay, now we get to the final phase of this. We've talked about motion, 1D motion, graphically, uh, conceptually, um, and then we've talked about uh, non-uniform motion and acceleration. All this comes together that we can now handle the math behind things to fully understand and evaluate problems and do problems. Right? There are three, really four equations that are fundamental to um, analyzing motion. Okay, and these are the four. They are called the kinematic equations. And you'll be given a sheet on these. All right? You'll be given a sheet on these, and that helps explain the game and everything else like that, what I call the game. All right? These are three of these, which are the ones in the green box, are given on your AP physics sheet. This is on your equation sheet. I do not know why, but this fourth one up here. Uh, is not included on the sheet, uh, but it's probably one that you could you could memorize to um, to help yourself out. Um, but these three right here are the most common, right? And they are on your AP Physics sheet. Okay, so the best way to approach this is think of this as a game. Okay, if I look at these four um, equations here, right, the ones in the green and the one up top. What um, variables do I see? Right, variables as in, like for instance, instance t for time. Right, so let's let's make a list. Right, I have time. Uh, right there, I have acceleration. That's another variable. I have initial velocity. That's another variable. I have final velocity. Final velocity. Okay, so this one's time. I already covered that one. Uh, time, acceleration, time, initial velocity. I already got all those. Uh, okay, delta x. Delta x, otherwise known as displacement. Okay, go to this one. Delta x, got it, got it, got it, got it. Now go up to this one. Um, oops, and I think this is supposed to be delta x. Delta x. Um, so I got delta x, I got this, got this, and then I got this. Okay, so these are my five unknowns. Every problem I'll have um, five possible unknowns. I like to you know count it down like this, right? The game goes like this. There are five unknown variables, right? There are four kinematic equations to help solve for those unknown variables, right? So there's five. Five possible variables, there's four equations to help solve. All right? And this goes to the next slide. It plays like this. I give you a word problem. All right? There are five possible values in the, in the word problem, but I will only give you three. I will give you three knowns that are hidden in the words. I will ask you for a fourth variable. All right? That's going to be what you're going to be solving for. And, but there's going to be a fifth variable that you do not need. Okay? And identifying this one is the key. Because you're going to pick the equation that does not have the value you do not need. And this is a double, it sounds like a double negative, but I can't figure out a different way to say this. But pick the equation that does not have the value you do not need. So um, that's what this list is right here. If I look at this one right here, final velocity, initial velocity, acceleration, time. It does not contain delta x, all right? So if this fifth value I do not need is delta x, then I pick this one. Because if I have three knowns, let's say it's final velocity, initial velocity, and acceleration, and I have a fourth one I'm trying to answer, let's say that's time, then I can plug in those three values and solve for time. And same thing here. This one does not have final velocity. And this one does not have time, and this one does not have acceleration. Next step is you're going to plug it in and then solve algebraically, hopefully correctly. So let's look at this in practice. Okay, this is, this is, these example problems are very important. I have the steps as we go along on the left to help us as we, as we start. And this is question 2.1 out of the book. A rocket sled accelerates from rest at 50 meters per second squared. So remember, meters per second squared, 
seconds squared is an important thing. That's our acceleration for five seconds. Uh, what are the total distance traveled and the final velocity? So there's actually two questions here. Total distance traveled and then final velocity. Okay. First, step one. Interpret the problem to a drawing or a sketch. All right, so I could sketch this out. Uh, this is not... This is optional, but it does help your conceptual understanding. Um, so my pen's acting up today, so I'll try to do this as best as I can. So I have some kind of thing. I have a rocket sled. It's like a sled and something like this. It starts at rest. So what is that? What does it actually it says from rest? What does that mean? Well, that means my initial velocity is equal to zero meters per second. Okay, zero meters per second. Uh, it accelerates, right, <clears throat> and say to the right, we're just going to assume to the right, and and then it reaches some final speed down here, tries to draw it about the same size, whatever, and it reaches some final velocity here. And we don't know what that is, that's one of the things we're going to solve for, so I'll put a question mark. Um, the other thing that we can say is that it has some kind of displacement. Uh, it says distance, but since we're going in a straight line, my distance and displacement are the same. This thing's not, you know, going back and forth or anything. Um, and then the other information I know is that there's a time interval of five seconds. Okay. So, let's go, that's my, that's my first part. Step one, done. Step two, list the known values. So what do I know? If I go up here, I have, um, I have you know, this and this as numbers, but I told you I have to give you three things. And it is true, I gave you three things. I gave you this, this as numbers, and I told you it started from rest, which is my initial velocity is zero. And that's a key one, you have to look at that. That's usually starting from a stoplight, or if something could be coming to rest, that could be a final velocity. All right. So, okay, uh, list my knowns. So I know that I know that my initial velocity is equal to zero meters per second. I know that my time is five seconds. And I know that my acceleration right, is 50 meters per second squared. So these are my three knowns. Okay, step three. List the values that are unknown or you're being asked to find. I'm going to do this one thing at a time. So we're going to find delta x first. Is how many meters? Okay. Pick the correct mathematical equation based off of the situation. All right, so initial velocity, time, acceleration, and delta x, or displacement or distance in this case. Uh, the one thing I do not see in that list is final velocity. So I need to pick the equation that does not have final velocity. All right, so uh, if I remember what that is, then that is going to be delta x equals initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time squared. Okay, uh, I start plugging in my values. Delta x equals initial velocity is zero. My time is five seconds. Right? plus one half fifty times five seconds squared. And I usually put the um, the you know meters per second squared and the seconds and all that stuff in there. I just haven't done it in this case. Okay, so one by one, zero times five, well that's zero. So basically that value goes away. And that equals one half times fifty so that is 25 times 5 squared. 5 squared is 25, so this is the same thing as 25 times 25. 25 squared 
is 625. So 625, right? And it's a displacement, so that is in meters. Okay? So that is my first answer. What's a distance traveled? Second one, what is my final velocity? All right? So now, now I have one, two, three, and I know this one, right? I know this value now. So I have four things that I know, and I'm being asked to find a fifth one. Now the fifth one now is final velocity. Final velocity equals what? Meters per second. If I have four, and I'm trying to find a fifth one, that becomes easy. I get to pick any equation I want that has final velocity. So my favorite equation, the easiest equation, is this one. The first one usually in the list. Final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. So I start plugging my values in. What's my initial velocity? Zero. What's my acceleration? 50 meters per second squared. And what's my time? Five seconds. So my final velocity is equal to 250 meters per second. OK. So, we've got the next one. Fully loaded Boeing 747 with all its engines at full thrust accelerates at 2.6 meters per second squared and minimum takeoff speed is 70 meters per second. How much time will the plane take to reach its takeoff speed? What minimum length of runway does the plane need for takeoff? So let's interpret. First, the easiest thing to do is just go through and just grab numbers. So what numbers can we grab? Uh, 2.6 meters per second. 50. 70 meters per second, I'm sorry, 2.6 meters per second squared, 70 meters per second, and that's it. But I remember I have to give you three things, so let's see. Um, what we will have to assume in this case, if it's takeoff, then we'll have to assume that it's starting at rest, right? It gets to into the taxiway, and then it's at rest, and then it starts off down, down the runway. Okay, so that's going to be our th third value. All right, so let's write down our knowns. Okay, these are our knowns and unknowns for the first part. Uh, initial velocity is zero. That had to come from an assumption, but it's a safe assumption. Acceleration, 2.6 meters per second squared. And a final velocity as it takes off at 70 meters per second. Uh, time is what we're looking for. How much time will the plane take to reach its takeoff speed? So the one value that I do not see in this list is delta x. So I need to pick the equation that does not have delta x. So this is that equation. Uh, final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Now I'm going to plug in the values and solve for time. Okay, I've plugged in the values now, and then I need to rearrange this to solve for time. Okay, now I've plug those in, solve for time, and I get the time of 26.9 seconds. I guess I could look at significant figures. Uh, I'll assume that that final velocity would have two significant figures there. Uh, so I could make that 27 seconds as a final answer if I, if I needed to. Okay, that's the first um, answer to the first one. What's the minimum length of runway the plane needs? So what displacement does it have from its initial at rest to... Uh, its final position. So now we're going to add to this list delta x, right, of what we're trying to find. We found this value right there. Now we're going to uh, find uh, delta x right here. And that's not going to be seconds, but that's going to be meters. Okay. So we're going to find an equation now that has delta x and what we need. So for me, this is the easiest equation to use. Um, and so now we're going to, we found the equation. Uh, we could have used anything that you had delta x because we had all the other values. And now we're going to plug and answer. Okay, now we plugged it in and we've solved and we found that 942.3 meters, or if I had to report this with two significant figures, it would be 940 meters. Um, if you noticed here, I took a, um, when I plugged in time right here, I took the unrounded answer that I had from my calculator. Um, and that's key. If I get an answer here, then um, that's fine for that answer. But when I go put that in further uh, solutions, I have to use the unrounded, um, unrounded number or the most you know 
most decimal places or whatever. So I get the idea now I have 942 meters, and these are my two answers right here. Next example, a car is traveling at a speed of 30 meters per second on wet pavement. The driver sees a deer ahead and decides to stop. From the instant, it takes him 0.75 seconds to begin applying the brakes. Remember, he cannot apply the, you know, make a decision to apply the brakes until after he's seen the deer. Once the brakes are applied, the car experiences an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second. Oh, it's supposed to be squared. How far does the car travel from the instant the driver notices the deer until stopping? Okay. This one is a hard one to think about, but essentially we're going to say there's two things going on. First, the car is traveling at a speed of 30 meters per second. All right? The driver sees a deer. While he is processing that thought and, you know, you know, before he starts braking, during that time, that car is still going 30 meters per second. Okay. He begins to brake. Now he has an acceleration, a negative acceleration, right? And that acceleration is 60 meters per second, all right? So, uh, negative 60 meters per second squared. How far does a car travel from the instant the driver notices a deer? Now it's going to be probably important on this one to draw a picture first. And that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, here's my uh, picture. I know it's crude, but here it is. Okay, so now I'm going to start applying my ideas uh, that I have from uh, this section. So initially I have 30 meters per second speed, right? There is a time interval... I'll say right here, from here to here. All right, in this phase, the driver is processing what he sees, which is this ugly deer down here. And uh, during that time, he is going 30 meters per second. All right, so from this interval to this interval, there is a time, and that was given to me in the problem, a time of 0.75 seconds. So there's so the time interval here, the delta T, really is 0.75 seconds. Okay? Um, now at the end of this interval I have to assign this car right here, I have to assign that a speed. Well, at the end of this interval he's still going 30 meters per second. He hasn't applied the brakes and done anything else like that. So I'll zoom in here and I'll say my velocity at this point is 30 meters per second. Okay? And that's all we really know about that first interval, right? Then he hits the brakes, and once the brakes are applied, the car experiences an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared. So basically during this interval, between here and then uh, between here and when the car stops, right here, I have an acceleration in the opposite direction, which means an acceleration of negative 6.0 meters per second squared. Alright? And let's see, anything else that I know about that uh, the situation? Let's see, any other numbers? No. No other numbers, but that doesn't mean there's no other information. Because it says, how far does a car travel um, until stopping? Alright, so stopping means that this is now a final velocity of zero. So again, there's information in there like little Easter eggs. So now I zoom out. So the question is asking me, how far does the deer travel from the instant the driver sees a deer, which is here, oops, which is here, to where it stops? So I need to find this entire displacement. So delta x, and I'll call it, put a t there for total. Delta x total. All right. So what I'm going to call this is I'm going to call this phase one, and this phase two. So if I want to find that total distance, what I need to do is find the distance for each one. So I need to find this delta x one equals what? All right. And I need to find this delta x two equals what? And eventually I'll have to put those together and find that total delta x. 
Okay, so the first interval, uh, 30 meters per second, and does that for 0.75 seconds. There is no acceleration. Anytime there is no acceleration, there is only one equation I can use. Velocity equals delta x divided by t. If I want to fall, solve for delta x, right, then it's velocity times time, which is, uh, so here's my delta x, and velocity is 30, time is 0.75, and that can get me a displacement of 30 times 0.75 of 22.5 meters. Oops, that's a very bad 5. 22.5 meters. Okay, so I found my first one. That one's easy. Now let's go find my second one. All right, what values do I have? I have... I have a initial velocity equals 30 meters per second. I have a final velocity equals 0 meters per second. I have an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared. Uh, I need to find a delta x from these values. The thing I do not need is time. So I'm going to come over here and let's solve for, I'm going to make this blue a little bit darker, and let's solve for delta x. X. Uh, the best one I can use is uh, t, uh, 2a delta x equals final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared. So 2 times, I'm going to start plugging in, negative 6.0, delta x is what I'm trying to solve for, final velocity is 0, initial velocity is 30. All right. And now I can rearrange and say um, I'm going to have uh, nine, uh, 30 squared is 900, and that's going to be divided by uh, 2 times uh, negative 6, so that's going to be negative. So negative 900 divided by negative 12 it means 75. Okay, so this is phase 2. Essentially, I could put all those twos back in there. Uh, has a uh, displacement of 75 meters. Phase one had a displacement of um, 22.5. Phase two had a displacement of 75. The total displacement is those two added together. So I will have a total displacement of uh, 90. Let me do that. 97.5 meters. Right, that's my delta x. Okay, so the key thing here is anytime we have two different accelerations, we have to break it into uh, separate. Right, we have to break it into separate phases. Right, phase one and phase two, different accelerations for each one. This one has negative six meters per second, and this one has an acceleration of zero. All right, if you have an acceleration that has no value, then there's only one equation you can use. If you have, do have an acceleration, then you have to use the kinematic equations and you have to play the game. So anytime you see a, a problem that has two different accelerations or two different phases, the key thing is breaking them up and solving them separately. Okay, now we're going to talk about objects that are in something called free fall. Okay, non-uniform motion was our term for acceleration. And essentially up to now we've been dealing with cars going back and forth, you know, right and left. Right, and that's been one dimensional motion. Now we're going to talk about objects going up and down, right, but specifically up and down um, without anything else touching them. Right, so it's not we're not talking about elevators or anything else like that. We're talking about objects that you know have nothing, you know, no strings attached, nothing touching them, and so we call this free fall. Uh, essentially, the <coughs> gravity is the only influence. Right. The only thing touching it, in a way, is gravity, right? which is an, an invisible remote force. Um, one thing we have to do is we're going to ignore air friction uh, for simplicity. Um, and uh, So here's some examples. You, you toss a ball in the air, like in the example here. That's free fall the entire way. Or it could just be dropped. If the same person just dropped the ball like this, that's also free fall. The key thing is if I just stop at any time and say what things are acting on it, then gravity is your only answer. Okay. Um, 
all objects fall at the same rate. It doesn't matter if we ignore air friction. It does not matter if it's heavy or light. It will uh, fall at the same rate. And the video in class will you know, beautifully demonstrate that. All right, there's a feather in a bowling ball in a vacuum or in space, you know, on the moon or something like that, would actually fall at the exact same rate, would hit the ground at the same time, even though here on Earth it's a different case. Okay, so now we're going to go through the conceptual process of a ball being thrown up into the air and being returning and returning back to your hand. Right, you can grab something, you know, get a pin, get a ball, get whatever, and you can do this as you follow along. First, ball is being tossed in the air. Describe its motion. Okay, if I toss it upwards as it leaves my hand, after it leaves my hand, the instant that it leaves my hand, right, it has a positive velocity. Positive velocity means it's going up. Right, this is true. It's going up at that time. Now. As the ball climbs higher and higher, right? So as the ball comes, climbs higher and higher, so here's my initial velocity like this, right? As the ball gets higher and higher, this velocity decreases. And it gets to the point, right? So velocity becomes slower, right? And it gets to the point at the top of its trajectory, right? It was positive, right? This is going up, positive, up. Right? And then at this top of the trajectory, it's switching between going up and going now down. Right? So if this is positive, going up, and negative means it's going down, because down is negative for us, right? there has to be some transition in between. Which means at this top point right here, the transition between positive and negative on the number line is zero. Right? There is zero velocity at the top of the trajectory. So essentially at the top for an instant it has no speed, no velocity. Right? So it slows down on its way up, right? And then it speeds up on its way down. As it descends the velocity increases, but now in the negative direction. Right? So it's accelerating downwards. It reaches its hand at a high negative velocity. So basically it starts off with zero velocity right here. And then as it comes, it starts, you know, getting more and more velocity, and then it has um, high, high uh, negative velocity as it comes back down to the hand. So grab a ball, throw it up, and uh, witness this. This is also, you know, why we think about it's easiest to hit a ball or something like that when it's at the top of its trajectory. Because guess what? It is actually slow, all right, at the very top. This is a very important page. You cannot um, solve problems in this section without knowing these things. Okay. Special things about free fall. One, the ball experiences a constant negative acceleration. All right, so an acceleration in the y direction. So it's constantly negative, which means downwards. So negative acceleration means downwards. And that value, which we sometimes label g, right here, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, or 9.8 meters per second squared downward. Uh, this number actually subtly changes depending on where you are on Earth. I think here in Hasburg it's 9.78 or 9.79, but either way we use 9.8 as an accepted value. The entire time there is a downward acceleration. Okay, my acceleration is downward. But you say that's confusing because it's going upward for the first half. Well, I, yeah, it is. It is going up, but it's slowing down. So if it's going up and slowing down, that means the acceleration must be in the opposite direction. So the acceleration must be down. Okay? And the other thing is that as it reaches the top, it's now moving downward in this phase. This side over here is now moving downward. And it's getting faster, which means acceleration must be in the same direction. So the acceleration is constant the entire time, and it's downward. And that exact value for Earth is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. As we said in the last slide, you have a zero um, velocity at the top of the trajectory. Right? 
And the next one says the time it takes to reach the top of the trajectory is equal to the time it takes to get back down to the same height. So if it takes you know 1.2 seconds to go from here to here, guess what? It takes another 1.2 seconds to get back to this exact same position before. All right, so it's symmetric in that way. And then the last part is the speed at which the ball is caught, right? Uh, is equal to the speed at which, oh, sorry, the speed at which the ball is launched is equal to the speed at which the ball is caught. So if I launch this at 10 meters per second, okay, 10 meters per second, that's positive because it's going up. Uh, that means when it comes back down, guess what? It's also going 10 meters per second, just in the negative direction. Okay, so this is another symmetry thing. Right, and we'll use this to our advantage in our problems. These are very important um, in order to do problems in here. We have to remember these four things. Key thing, always uh, negative acceleration downwards at 9.8. The top of the trajectory have zero velocity. Time it takes to get to the top is equal to the time it takes to get back down. The speed at which you throw the ball up is the speed at which it returns to your hand. It's just going in a different direction. So what does this look like on a motion diagram or on a um, graph? Well, first, if I look on the left here, um, the ball is thrown. The left, far left is it's on its way up. It has a, you know, basically a large initial velocity here. And then that shrinks as it goes up. All right, that means that there is a downward acceleration, which we already know. Right, on its way down, right, there's a sorry, there's a point up here, I guess you can say that there's zero velocity, you can't even draw a vector for it. Um, and on its way down, these vectors get longer, which means it's accelerating, which means it's going down. So I started off with a high positive value, I ended up with a high so I started off with a high positive value, ended up with a high negative value. High positive to high negative. So I started off here, and I'm gonna end up down here. And the rate at which, right, this is a constant straight line, right, uh, and has a slope of negative 9.8. Right, so this is the graph of anything in free fall. Uh, it's something, or specifically something being thrown up into the air and then constantly accelerating downwards. Okay. Now, you got to remember probably the position versus time probably looks something like this, that it goes up in the air, and something like this, okay? But a um, velocity versus time looks like this, where the slope, which is the acceleration, equals negative 9.8. Okay, so now we're going to still play our same kinematic equation games, right? But now we're going to have certain shortcuts and cheats that we have. Um, it'll be confusing, I'll be honest, because you're going to be thinking that you don't have enough information. Right? And the key thing is that that information is inside the concept. And that's why those four things from the previous slide are so important. So let's look at here. The heavy rock is dropped from rest at the top of a cliff and falls 100 meters before hitting the ground. So remember, uh, the kinematic equation game is I give you three values. So there must be three values that are hidden inside that one problem. So let's go f try to find them. It's, it's told us what we need to know. Let's try to find them. First one, we know 100 meters. So that's going to be a displacement. But that's the only number, and so we feel like we need more. But in fact, it's hidden in our, um, it's hidden in our concept. First of all, if it's dropped and it's in the air, then what is acting on it? Well, the only thing acting on it is gravity. Right? And so if that's true, then it's in free fall. And if that's true then it must have an acceleration in y of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, what else? Uh, it's dropped from rest. Okay, well that's actually in the words, I can use that. So my initial velocity is 0 meters per second. All right, and then the third thing I was given is it falls 100 meters. So I have a delta x or a delta y. Uh, I'll keep it delta x um, 
just for matching the equations, and that's okay. All right, so displacement. Now, the key thing is if it falls, right, so here's my drawing. Stick figure guy dropping the rock, right? If it falls, if this is 100 meters high, right, so what's my displacement? It's my final position minus my initial position, right? So my final position is actually, if I set this to be my origin, is actually zero. Zero meters is my final position. My initial position is 100. So if I do final minus initial, that's 0 minus 100. So I have a displacement of negative 100 meters. And this is true any time I go from a high position to a low position. Okay, what am I being asked? How long does it take? Okay, so that is a time. So let's find time first. The one thing I do not care about in this list, or it's not given in this list, is final velocity. So I pick the equation that does not have final velocity. And that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so here's my equations. Uh, that's my equation I'm going to use. Um, this one does not have final velocity. Um, I'm trying to solve for time, so I'm going to have to plug in values here and then solve for time. So that's what I'm going to do now. I have my values plugged in. Uh, notice that my initial velocity was zero, which helps because that eliminates this first part right here. All right? If that didn't eliminate, then I'd have to solve it the rest of the way using a quadratic formula. But in this case, I do not have to do that. So now I'm going to solve the rest of the way and come up with an answer. Okay, my answer is um, 4.5. Let's keep it at about... Um, 4.52 um, seconds. Sorry, this pin is acting up today. Um, 4.52 seconds. Right, that's how long does it take to fall to the ground. Uh, with significant figures, you could analyze it, and depending on um, uh, what you see over here, you do two significant figures um, and, say, 4.5 seconds. Okay. Um, and second part, uh, what is the velocity when it hits the ground? So now I know, uh, I know this, uh, so I have 1, 2, 3, and 4 values. I, just, I can pick anything I want that has final velocity. So my favorite equation is this. So initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Okay, remember whenever I plug in time, I want to use my unrounded answer. Um, so my final velocity, what I'm solving for, uh, is equal to my initial velocity, which is 0, plus uh, acceleration, which is negative 9.8, times my time, 4.5, well, uh, 175, whatever. I'm going to use my calculator answer, but um, I'll just use show that right there. So, uh, so I got negative 9.8 times my calculator stored answer. And that gives me a final velocity of negative 442.27 meters per second. And with sig figs, two sig figs, you can make that 44, negative 44 meters per second. But again, final velocity, I need a you know, magnitude and direction. So you have to give me that negative there. So here are my two answers.